60 seconds and counting. We are go for Apollo 7 at this time. Our second speaker for today is a uh, private pilot, a military aerospace historian, has lectured across the USA on the unique subject of mystery aircraft and classified propulsion systems buried deep within the military industrial complex. He has presented evidence that supports the claim that elements within the military industrial complex, specifically than the American uh, aerospace industry, have designed, built, and test, uh, you know, saucer-shaped aircraft which uh, mimic the form, fit, and function of what we perceive to be extraterrestrial UFOs. So the question is, does this technology now exist, actually, to take you know, ET home? Well, he's done a lot to dig out information about the black budget, off-black budget, special access programs that have laid uh, the financial groundwork for those who have been developing secret aerospace mega-projects. Uh, this material is really uh, interesting. It's, uh, you know, kind of fills some of the missing gaps between what we know exists and what is speculation as well. So this will really kind of help to solidify the subject as well that we heard so much about from Mark. So it's going to be really interesting. He's going to talk to us about the man-made versus ET issue. So give a big round of applause for Michael Schratt. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to join all of you today. What I'd like to do for you today is give you a brief overview of some of the classified aircraft that have been developed within the military-industrial complex. I want to talk about some aircraft that might be uh, considered UFOs but may actually be man-made craft. I want to discuss the black budget, and then I also want to talk about some crash retrievals. But really, I want to have some fun with this presentation, and we've got uh, quite a bit of material to go over here. I thought I'd begin with this uh, interesting entry that was put into a book published in 2007 called The Reagan Diaries. And here on page 334, this is Reagan speaking to, it says, lunch with five top scientists. It was fascinating. Space truly is the last frontier. And some of the developments there in astronomy are like science fiction, except they are real. I learned that our shuttle capacity is such that we could orbit 300 people. So I want to ask all of you today, uh, the shuttle only holds eight astronauts. How does Reagan get this 300 people going into this shuttle system? How, how could this possibly be true? Then we've got some interesting statements made by Neil Armstrong. It says, uh, this is July 20th, 1994 at the White House. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those that can re remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. Neil Armstrong, 25th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. Then we have Above Top Secret by Timothy Good. Interesting statement here, a transaction between a scientist of an MI6 individual and Neil Armstrong. And this is page 186, so I'm not just making this up. Uh, Professor, what really happened there on Apollo 11? Armstrong, it was incredible, of course. We'd always known there was a possibility. The fact is, we were warned off. There was never any question then of a space station or a moon city. Professor, how do you mean warned off? Armstrong, I can't go into details except to say that their ships were far superior to ours, both in size and technology. Boy, they were big and menacing. No, there is no question of a space station. So, again, this is page 186 of Timothy Good's Above Top Secret. So it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, that there are, in point of fact, two space programs one in the form of a public relations smokescreen organization known as NASA. The other one is called U.S. Air Force Space Command, also known as Solar Warden, and that comes from Paul Lee Violette and the Huffington Post, 12-7-2012. Here's another question we need to look at, too. Did the Rockwell Star Raker go operational? Is this what Ronald Reagan was talking about when he talked about the capability of orbiting 300 people. Obviously, he wasn't talking about putting those people into the shuttle cargo bay. This was a proposal uh, for a 1979 single stage to orbit, high-lift wing orbital launch vehicle, 310-foot length, 
360 foot wingspan, capacity of 200,000 pounds for the cargo, and it was powered by 10 high bypass turbofan ramjets, three liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen rocket engines. So this could have been something that we as the general public were never clued in on, but Reagan may have actually been given a briefing. A couple of quick announcements here. Uh, the visual aids used in this presentation are computer-generated forensic composite illustrations based off the actual UFO case files and military defense trade publications. Source material was QFOS, NICAP, the APRO archives, Aviation Week Space Technology, Jane's Defense Weekly, Invisible Residence by Ivan T. Sanderson, which I highly recommend, uh, Uninvited Guest by Richard Hall, Magic Eyes Only, UFO News Clipper Service, Wendell Stevens Archives, and the Leonard Stringfield Collection. I kind of want to start right here, and you might be thinking, why in the world am I showing a picture of a Dorito here? What does a Dorito have to do with a secret space program? Well, back in 1984, this configuration was the most classified configuration that you'd ever want to see. In point of fact, <clears throat> this configuration was so classified, engineers working on the program associated with that configuration were forbidden to bring in a bag of Doritos out of fear that the configuration of this aircraft might be revealed. That's how secret this was. This is the A-12 Avenger II, also known as the Flying Dorito. This was a joint McDonnell Douglas General Dynamics program designed to replace the A-6 Intruder as an all-weather attack aircraft. Procurement funding for this was $4.78 billion of your tax dollars went into a full-scale research development contract for General Dynamics, McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell Douglas was brought onto the contract because of their experience with naval carrier-based aircraft. That's why McDonnell Douglas was actually brought on. Now, we were going to buy, the Navy was going to buy 620 of these aircraft. Again, this is what we've got to show for it here with, with this Dorito here. But this is the full-scale mock-up that was made. And th this is essentially all we have to show for our $4.878 billion because it was on January the 7th of 1991 that Dick Cheney canceled this program and cost us all $5 billion. So I've been looking for a couple of, about a decade now, trying to track where our money disappeared to. Since we as taxpayers have funded this program, we own these type programs, we have every right to question authority, and this is something that we really should keep in mind. Uh, different publications, Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Washington Post, they talk about $57 billion jet for Navy is canceled, citing cost overruns, Cheney kills Navy attack planes, stealth jet for Navy is canceled. So I want to give you something to hang your hat on here. According to C-SPAN, and I've got all the dates here so you can verify this for yourself, they said, quote, over three million pounds of material have been cut on the A-12 Avenger II program. That was July 24th, 1991. So you've got all this material, all these hardware, all these tooling type things. Where, where did all this go? What do we have to show for our $5 billion? Um, since Lockheed Martin bought the General Dynamics Aeronautical Division, your point of contact is a woman by the name of Karen Hagar. She's the public affairs person. And by all means, please ask her where your $5 billion portion went. I've included her email address. Her telephone number is 817-763-4085. Okay? Please ask her where your $5 billion went. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's so highly secretive that I said, come on, guys, can't you guys even give me a washer from the program? Just give me a washer. They wouldn't even do that. So I commissioned our good friend Mark McCandlish. I said, Mark, these guys are going to play it like this. Would you please put together a, an illustration depicting what the A-12 Avenger II would look like on the assembly line? And this is what we came up with. And it's a really good drawing by Mark McCandlish. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this is probably the closest we're ever going to see regarding the A-12 Avenger II program. However, there may actually be more to this story than meets the eye. There, there might be something secret going on with the A-12 Avenger II. 
This is a letter written to a, a colleague of mine by the name of Lee Graham. This is from Armin Victorian, date de, uh, December 30th, 1992. I want to bring your attention to this bottom section down here. And he says, uh, section A, Navy's A-12 prototype was completed and flown by Lockheed. Completed and flown by Lockheed. Okay. Two other sources have confirmed from General Dynamics that right around 1990, Lockheed basically picked up the pieces of the A-12 Avenger II program from General Dynamics. They've confirmed that there were, in point of fact, two assembly lines running at General Dynamics. One was the Navy version, which was canceled by Dick Cheney, January 7th, 1991, and there, there was a secret Air Force version of this aircraft. Now, when Ben Rich, who is the head of the Skunk Works between 1975 and 1991, when his team at the Skunk Works took a look at this uh, edge here, uh, they, they noticed that a single straight edge was very l bad for radar cross-section. So Lockheed Skunk Works engineers designed a notch into the trailing edge. They also clipped the wing tips to reduce the radar cross-section. And that is the AX-12 Air Force version of the A-12 Avenger II, which is completely black. Now, back in 2000, a one-third scale-up version of this aircraft, which is used as a stealthy troop insertion aircraft, uh, was actually built by Lockheed. It's between the F-117 in size and the B-2. So there's this interim aircraft between those two aircraft. That aircraft was sighted over Amarillo, Texas by multiple eyewitnesses. And then in last, uh, last month, I was with Steve Douglas, who's another aircraft researcher, and we were at this exhibit here. This is a very interesting hangar complex that they have on the other side of the tarmac. And he brought his radio with him, and he overheard the term Little Area 51 at Cannon Air Force Base. So it appears that there's a smaller version of Area 51 at Cannon Air Force Base. Now we've got the Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey. This was declassified October 2002 under the Bush administration. $67 million procurement funding from Boeing on this particular program. It made 38 test flights between 1992 and 1999. <clears throat> Basically this aircraft was the first aircraft to use low observable um, stealth technology for one piece solid construction. And it also had 3D virtual reality design and assembly processes involved with this aircraft. Procurement funding, again, is $67 million. It was 47 feet long, 23 foot wingspan. Important point to keep in mind on the Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey is that when you have a proprietary program, it is ex exempt from FOIA requests. So you can't get anything else on the Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey. This is one of those proprietary programs. Another drawing done by Mark McCandlish, uh, talking about the Sneaky Pete, also the Hab Blue prototype, and then Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey. Detroit Free Press, secret ledger hides military projects. Pentagon black budget has tripled under Reagan administration. So I want to quote my sources, Detroit Free Press, February 8th, 1987. They had a very interesting graphic illustration, which I've uh, redone in AutoCAD here to give you an idea. Now, if you look at the procurement funding on these programs, in 1981, the black budget grew by just over half a billion dollars. Now, by 1988, that figure rose to uh, nearly 9.122 billion. So you can see there's this exponential growth in the black budget. Federal spending by category, procurement spending for agriculture was 26 billion. Transportation was 28 billion, but the Pentagon's black budget for fiscal year 1988 was 35 billion. So they're spending more on black budget programs than they are for education. So is there a mismanagement of funding here? Do we have bridges breaking? Do we have schools falling apart? That money could be put into other programs. Total uh, spending for procurement funding of the Air Force for 88 was 51, of which 19.1 was in the black budget. Okay, now in this article, they have two quotes that I think are interesting to, to keep in mind here. It says, Thomas Amley, a Pentagon missile expert with security clearances high enough to know about some black programs, said the military has three basic reasons for having them. One, you're doing something that should genuinely be secret. Two, you're doing something so damn stupid you don't want anyone to know about it. And three, you want to rip open the money bag and get out a shovel because there's no accountability. 
So when you talk about black programs, there is no public scrutiny, no congressional oversight. Second one here, it says, in a black project, people don't worry about money, said a 31-year-old systems engineer who has worked on four black projects at the Space Systems Division of Lockheed Missiles and Space Company in Sunnyvale, California. Here's what he said. If you need money, you got it. If you screw up and you need more, you got it, said the engineer who asked that his name not be published. You're just pouring money into this thing until you get it right. There's no incentive to do it right the first time. Who's going to question it? So you can see the mentality of what we're really up against here. Aviation Week, Space Technology, December 24th, 1990, summed it up really well. Eight years of the Reagan administration were very good to the black world. Really sums it up nicely. Now, how do you get this information? Where do you go to track the black budget? It turns out every January 26th, seventh of every year, a public relations program in the form of this document, which is available to the general public, is called RDT&E Programs R1. That stands for Research, Development, Test, and Evaluation Programs R1. You can pick this up at the Library of Congress. And in this document, they list programs that are within the Department of Defense. Over here, you've got the line items and then you've got how much was spent. But when it comes to classified programs, they don't tell you anything about it. For instance, senior year operations, forest green operations, no technical details, no information regarding how much procurement funding was done on the program. So what you end up doing here is you take the total amount and you subtract the knowns, and what you're left with are the unknowns or the black programs. Now, how can we verify this? Defense Daily, July 14, 1988, also had their procurement funding. And you can see here, Theme Castle, no information, just a code name. Senior Citizen, we've got Omega, it's a black program. We don't know the details. So again, you take the total amount, subtract the knowns, what you're left with are the unknowns. This is an interesting uh, publication, 1970, J.W. Fulbright, he really brought it home. It says, the greatest threat to American national security is the American military establishment and the no-holds-barred type of logic it uses to justify its zillion-dollar existence. These programs have gone rogue, uh, no congressional oversight. A couple of quick code names I want to bring to your attention here. This comes from John Andrews, who's the senior project design engineer at Testers Model Corporation in San Diego. He was tracking these black budget fundings, and he wrote this FOIA request to the DOD, and a couple of things we want to look at here. Rosetta, classified program. Housekeeping, what's housekeeping? Redbird, and then the two final ones, four and five, Rainbow and something called Snowbird, which we really want to get into. Groom for Secrecy, Groom Lake Toxic Burning Alleged, Las Vegas Review Journal, March 20th, 1992. They really did a good job on this article. Basically what they're saying is, during the stealth program, vintage 1981 to right around 1988, uh, according to this article, <clears throat> Burbank Lockheed Skunk Works Division was basically trying to get rid of all their toxic chemicals, solvents, resins, and they put these in 55-gallon drums. And twice a week, on Mondays and Wednesdays, an 18-wheeler tractor-trailer truck hired by a foreign company called NDB would drive all the way from Burbank Skunk Works to Area 51. They'd follow this perimeter road. They'd go past the residential area, and then these 300-foot-long burning pits dump these 55-gallon drums into these burn pits and throw jet fuel on it and ignite the whole thing. So I ask all of you, is it any wonder that our Area 51 engineers are dying of cancer when you've got this acrid, toxic smoke burning and flowing right over the residential area? So I'm zooming in to Area 51. That's the world's largest runway. You could put one space shuttle landing on either side and still have 5,000 feet between the two aircraft. And then I'm going to zoom into this area. The hangar surface area on the bottom here are what's known as the Red Hat hangars for the Soviet MiGs. Before that, they were the A-12 hangars. Just in back of the Red Hat hangars are what's known as the U-2 spy plane hangars. That's where final assembly was made for the U-2. We've also got the residential area, and then up here on the corner, uh, we've got the area where it shows the burn pits right in here. So that's what we want to focus in on. 
Here's a 1968 photo of Area 51 showing the residential area. These are the burn pits here. So uh, the question I want to ask all of you, this is something we really should answer. Who is the idiot within the Air Force, Department of Defense, EPA, that allowed them to do this right next to the residential area? I mean, talk about lack of planning. It's just horrible. They had a sidebar article within this Las Vegas Review Journal um, that I really want to talk about here. And it's talking about the bar that was at Area 51 <clears throat> called Sam's Place. And this is what they talked about from one who was actually there. Extravagant living on a secret base. So these are, this is your tax dollars at work here. A favorite watering hole was Building 170, the hangar size centerpiece of the base's recreational complex. It is listed in one base directory as Sam's Place, a bar named after a Central Intelligence Agency official who once ran the base, set a source involved in base operations during the 1980s. Sam's Place was a dark, fully carpeted nightclub with large padded chairs and a bar ring with stools that rivaled the largest ones in Las Vegas, the source said. The club had four pool tables, dart boards, and a big screen. The recreational complex was complete with an eight-lane bowling alley, a heated indoor pool, four racquetball courts, a basketball gymnasium with a wooden floor, tennis courts, saunas, and a snack bar. At one time, a golf course and lighted softball field existed as well. Supplies for the base were flown in from Hill Air Force Base in Utah aboard C-130s. Sometimes people would chip in and buy big ice boxes of shrimp that were flown specially to the base from Florida in 20 to 30 big styrofoam coolers. The plane stopped only long enough to offload the shrimp. And then the final one here, some colonels, he said, had very extravagant tastes, including one who had grapefruits flown in from Israel at $25 a piece and requested deliveries of canned tuna from South America that he estimated cost the government $26 per can. So here's your tax dollars at work with these big guys over here at Area 51. Another drawing by Mark McCandlish. This is the McDonnell Douglas Manta Ray. 18 of these aircraft were built by Desert Storm. They flew along with the F-117s as a digital real-time intelligence gathering aircraft, specifically photographic type aircraft. It was also carrier capable. It had a um, interesting arresting hook and also a launch contraption in the front for carrier-based operations. Very low radar cross-section aircraft and uh, had twin canned vertical stabilizers that you can see here. Orders of magnitude lower RCS than the F-117. Something called the Flying Artichoke has been sighted at Air Force Plant 42 in Holloman Air Force Base. It has a crew of two, pilot and a weapon system operator. It has a very interesting tail arrangement here with a porous aft section that absorbs sound. It's capable of carrying six 2,000-pound laser-guided weapons. So this is the flying artichoke. Now, right around 1989, we started hearing these reports of something called the Aurora. That's definitely not the code name that's actually used, but that's a catch-all phrase, really. And on 1989, August 1989, Chris Gibson, who was an offshore oil drilling platform operator, he noticed a KC-135 flying overhead that was flanked on the left side by two F-111s that had their wings extended. And then directly behind the KC-135, there was a black triangle that had a 75 degree swept wing configuration that he could not identify and he was a member of the Royal Naval Observers Corps. So if there's anyone who couldn't identify it, who should have, it would have been Chris Gibson because he's very well versed in identifying aircraft in less than one second. So we've reversed the image to show you what this actually could have looked like. This remains today, even today, a classified program. Now, if you look in the Boeing archives, you'll see this motif, this legacy of development regarding 75 degree swept wing configurations for hypersonic aircraft. This may be a configuration that Chris Gibson actually got to see. Another drawing by Mark McCandlish. Interesting backstory on this aircraft. When the colonel who first laid his eyes on this particular configuration, when he saw it for the first time, he said that that was an elegant lady. And so that name has stuck with this particular aircraft. It is a two-stage-to-orbit space plane consisting of a mothership and a parasitic aircraft that's launched from the spine of the uh, mothership. Each of these wingtips is estimated to be about 16 feet tall. 
It has a pilot, co-pilot, and something called a launch control officer. He is the liaison between the mothership and the parasitic aircraft, and he sits aft in the last seat here. It has two canards that can retract for high-speed flight. It's powered by either four combined cycle pulse detonation wave engines, or as Mark mentioned, the scramjets too. Now, what evidence do we have for this? Aviation Week Space Technology, August 24th, 1992, talks about eyewitnesses who saw this in the Antelope Valley, Lancaster, Palmdale area, so we've got some good sightings there. This is the model called the SR-75 Penetrator that was done by John Andrews, who again is the Senior Project Design Engineer at Testers Model Corporation, San Diego. And we believe that the mothership configuration here is about 85% correct. This parasitic aircraft that he has here has the correct wing sweep angle, but the configuration of where the engines are, we don't believe that that is correct. This is a photograph of John Andrews, so if there was any question about this gentleman's integrity, uh, it was never challenged because he was a gentleman uh, until he passed away in 1999. His, his uh, veracity was never questioned, so you can hang your hat basically on information provided by John Andrews. A good uh, scale model of what this looked like. Interesting thing, people who have seen this said that the configuration and color of this aircraft was kind of a light white or gray configuration with a blacked leading edge. And then the air intakes on this aircraft were diagonally cut at 45 degrees. And they said that people who saw this particular aircraft take off said that the air intakes were so large that you could drive a Volkswagen right into these. So we're talking large air intakes. John McNeil put this together, shows you the two-stage orbit space plane system. Again, you can see the air intakes in this location and these large winglets. Uh, this is a top view looking down, shows you the scale of this aircraft here. And then we believe that this aircraft is not called Aurora, but in point of fact, either Senior Year or Senior Smart. That's believed to be the code name for this particular aircraft. Now, one other propulsion system that may be associated with the mothership of this aircraft is something that Mark T. Constantine, who was the Aerojet Tech Systems Division Manager, this is 1985, he'd get a, he gave a lecture. Here is one propulsion system that may be associated with that two-staged orbit space plane system. Here's what he said. The air turbo ramjet, or ATR, is a combined cycle air breathing engine, which we commonly refer to as cold turbine technology. By combining the rocket engine and air breathing engine technologies, the ATR can achieve static thrust to weight capability in excess of that available from our most advanced turbojet and turbofan engines. The ATR continues to produce thrust as Mach number increases, which enables acceleration to more optimal cruise altitudes of 90 to 120,000 feet at Mach 5. So this is exactly the kind of speed range we're talking about here. But then there's a question that comes up, this strange anomaly that comes up. This took place... Uh, <laughs> May 30th, 1991, John Andrews, who we mentioned before, put in a telephone call to Ben Rich. And this is something that Ben Rich volunteered. He wasn't uh, prodded by John. This is something that Ben Rich came up with. This was published in the 1993 OFNI World Almanac. So I want to give you the, the source of where this came from. The Spanish translation to English here is, if I were to use the word snowbird, I would be in jail. If I were to use the word snowbird, I would be in jail. What is Ben Rich talking about? What could be so secret, so classified, so unacknowledged that Ben Rich would get thrown in jail for even using the word snowbird? I mean, what, what, what's actually going on here? It turns out in 1982, Pratt and Whitney, who has a long history with Lockheed because they developed the J-58 that powered the SR-71, they developed something called a magnetohydrodynamic drive, also known as an MHD. A couple of quick points. Utilizes electric and magnetic fields. So this is not an engine, ladies and gentlemen. This is a drive system. There's no moving parts. It probably is the propulsion system for Snowbird, developed by Pratt & Whitney in 1982. Speeds above Mach 20. So that's way out there in the speed regime. 
Hypersonic Aurora, what could this thing actually look like that uses the MHD drive? Something that Jane's Defense Weekly, December 12, 1992, had a really good article about the configuration. Again, we see this 75 degree swept wing configuration. So there's this motif that's going through the 1960s all the way up to the 1992 article here. Now, Wizard of Oz, somewhere over the rainbow, is this... You know, is there more going on here? Somewhere over the rainbow. This is the song that Dorothy sang in this uh, very popular movie. Is there something more going on here, or is this just, just a song here? Uh, let me bring your attention to this letter uh, from Robert Jameson to John Andrews, February 28, 1994. Here's what he said. It says, he was a military monitor. On 367.7... I overheard a conversation between a KC-135 tanker at 47,000 feet calling Rainbow One that they were on station approximately, approximately seven minutes later. Rainbow One called, quote-unquote, Big Boy for a fill-up. The tanker returned the call but said, if you would turn on your lights, it would be easier to find you. Rainbow One told the tanker to go to secure channel G, end of transmission. So, if the Aurora is launched over the top of the mothership called Rainbow, somewhere in the ocean west of Hawaii. Is, it, is that where we get the term somewhere over the rainbow? If Rainbow is the mothership aircraft, it's a possibility. Aviation Week, Space Technology, November 11th, 1991. We're not going to read the whole thing, but just the, the top here. Two unusually loud sonic booms heard along the west coast from San Diego to North Las Vegas, uh, Angeles, ha may have been producing uh, high-flying classified aircraft returning test ranges in Nevada. So they were talking about airquakes, not uh, earthquakes, but airquakes. So I actually contacted Caltech and I said, can you give me your data for October 31st, 1991? And this is the actual result. They call it an air a sonic. At the exact same time this aircraft flew over, it triggered all these uh, instruments from Caltech and the Geolo Geologic Institute. So, ladies and gentlemen, I believe this might be one of the most conclusive pieces of evidence for a quote-unquote Aurora aircraft. Now, the most important thing to keep in mind here is that these airquakes, these aircraft flying over hmm, Catalina Island, going over downtown Los Angeles, always occurred on a Thursday morning. A Thursday morning at like 6.58 a.m., 7.05 a.m., repeatedly on the last Thursday of the month in, during 1991 and 1992. Always on a Thursday. Why a Thursday? Because in the black world, Area 51, Air Force Plant 42, Test flights are done on a Thursday because Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday are used for prep. Thursday is the test flight. Friday is the debrief. Saturday and Sunday, there's no one there. And so that's why Thursdays are very apparent in the black world. This is an article, a uh, paper that was received by Lee Graham from the United States Department of Interior. It says, Dear Mr. Graham, in response to your letter of 31, 1992, please in find enclosed a copy of data recorded by a seismograph at Catalina Island for the sonic boom of January 30th, 1992. So if you look at what's done here, <clears throat> here's what he says. Last Thursday of the month, Thursday, October 31st, 1991, and remember, these tick marks are one minute apart. So boom, right? This is your aurora returning from an overseas mission. Now, about a minute later, another boom right here. So you might think, oh, that's, that's that mothership, right? Returning along with it. The mothership isn't even back yet. It doesn't even fly the same pattern. So this might be either an F-16 or an F-15 flying as a safety chase aircraft. So it's not the mothership flying with the parasitic aircraft. Again, Thursday, June 27th, 1991, last Thursday of the month, boom, about mm, a minute later, another boom. So this is, again, seismic instrument readouts. Uh, Thursday, November 21st, 1991, we have another boom here, and then it says, bingo, it must be an American bird. They didn't want to work on Thanksgiving Day. So this time... It wasn't on the last Thursday of the month. It was the week prior. So you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of ours. There, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. 
Catalina Island, Thursday, January 30th, 1992, 7.17 a.m., another boom. And then about a minute and a half later, number two. So you can see you've got this parasitic aircraft flying over Catalina Island. It wakes everybody up in the morning in Los Angeles. And then a chase plane follows it. Here's the track returning to Area 51, going over Catalina Island, Los Angeles, waking everybody up, then heading uh, north of Edwards Air Force Base, going into Tonopah Test Range, and then into Area 51. So I want to give you kind of a brief cross-section of what their flight pattern looks like. Again, Catalina Island, Thursday, April 16, 1992, 6.58 a.m. Always on a Thursday, always on a Thursday. Mount Wilson, April 16, 1992, Thursday, 702, another one. It just goes on and on. The evidence is overwhelming. Okay, so here is a typical Snowbird mission profile flight path. This came from Jim Goodall. I, I asked Jim, I said, Jim, what's the flight path of these aircraft? And so he said, this is Jim Goodall's interpretation of what these aircraft may be flying. He believes, ladies and gentlemen, that this is a nuclear proliferation monitoring aircraft because at the fall of the Soviet Union, they had to figure out a way to monitor all this fissionable material that was kind of loose within the former Soviet Union. So he believes it's a nuclear proliferation monitoring aircraft. So what you do here is you start at Area 51. You take off from Area 51. You take up a, a magnetic heading of 310 degrees. You fly over Alaska. At this point here, you're still with the mothership. You're at about 30,000 feet of Mach 1.7. It's at this point you launch from the mothership. You pour the coals to it right here. You go over Russia. You make a 90-degree left-hand turn. You start heading south. You're over Turkey. You're over uh, Israel right in this area right here. Once you get down here, you make another turn. Now you pour the coals to it right here. You're heading back. At this point, you're over here. Now you're near Hawaii. You're starting to make a left-hand turn. Now we're heading into California. That's where we go over Catalina Island. This is where we wake everybody up at 7.02 a.m., right back to Area 51. So that may be the mission profile of what these aircraft are actually following. Now, this is something I got from the John Andrews collection, which I was for fortunate enough to acquire. This is 14th August, 1981. Letter to Ben Rich, former head of Lockheed Skunk Works between 1975 and 1991. It says, Ben Rich, your crew responsible for two very strange birds leaving at dawn, just at first light, from George Air Force Base. One white, one gray. Said to be very lippish-like. Good acceleration, good climb. Don't loiter around George and not seen for the rest of the day. So John, uh, John included a sketch of something that may have departed George Air Force Base, August 1981. Now, turns out that there's some very good information from Bill Scott, who's the former Rocky Mountain editor of Aviation Week Space Technology. This is March 26, 2006, talking about a program called Black Star. It appears, ladies and gentlemen, that there are two versions of this technology. There's one built by Lockheed that's launched from the spine of a mothership, and then Boeing has one called Black Star, which is airdrop from the belly of the craft. So that's the different kind of uh, configurations that are used. This is a Steve Douglas illustration with an XB-70 type configuration. Uh, is there any proof to back this up? This is a U.S. patent, February 7th, 1982, uh, 1989, by Boeing, and they include a parasitic aircraft that actually fits up inside an indented section under the belly of the mothership. So we've got patents to back this up. We've got eyewitnesses reported within that article that also talk about this as well. Then we come across this particular letter to Pete Ames from John Andrews. It says, uh, 22nd February, 1994, the place, Kadena Air Force Base, the time, the weekend of 12, 13th February, 1994. It says, emergency call from manned aircraft to expedite recovery at Kadena Air Force Base, coming from north tracked speed at Mach 4.2, diversions for other aircraft in area. Aircraft recovered and quickly placed in secure hangar. Red 3 lockdown declared by base. Other pilots landing kept and slept in ready quarters. Uh, one white gray C-5 launched from Holloman Air Force Base. Three-day lockdown at base. So something made an emergency landing at Kadena Air Force Base. Um, 
And this is the configuration per the Bill Scott article. They also mention that there was a solid rocket booster that is loaded into the aft end of this vehicle. So we're definitely talking at least Mach 4.2 for this particular configuration. The truth is out. Air Force's monthly, March 1997, September 26, 1994, was the date of, of, of an event that has never been talked about in American press. I had to get an overseas publication for this. And the, the details regarding this case was a top secret aircraft believed to have been a classified variant of the YF-23 by Northrop, had a crew of two. On the application of military power, somehow the landing gear collapsed right up here on the nose gear and this thing kind of ground to a halt. The pilots were fine. They had to tow it back to a hangar. It stayed in that hangar for two nights, and it had a tarp over the midsection. The aft section and the forward section was still exposed, so people could see what this thing actually looked like. On the third day, a C-5 Galaxy was flown into RAF Boscom Down. This is where this took place. And as they were departing, air traffic controllers and monitoring uh, public on the ground overheard the transmission that this C-5 Galaxy was going to KPMD. So anyone who knows what KPMD is, that's Palmdale. That's the identifier for Palmdale, or they were flying back to Palmdale. This is the configuration of what we actually believe this aircraft looks like. It was a, a variant of the YF-23 two-seat aircraft with two inward canted vertical stabilizers other than the YF-23 version that has two outward canted vertical stabilizers. So, we get to the B-2 stealth bomber. $2.3 billion per aircraft, more than its own weight in gold. That's what we're talking about here. 21 of these aircraft were built. <clears throat> Tremendous amount of money. I call this the $10 billion photograph because we've got four B-2s at the Pico Rivera plant 2.3, that's about $10 billion right there. And it's a 172-foot wingspan. The question is, and Mark talked about this before, is there more going on to the B-2 than meets the eye? Aviation Week Space Technology, March 9th, 1992, had a very interesting art article from uh, people who worked at Northrop who were very upset that the technology associated with the B-2 program was not being trickled down to the public industry. They talk about how the B-2 electrically charges the leading edge of the wing to reduce the radar cross signature. That's what you see in this diagram right here. And then negatively charges the exhaust gases to reduce the infrared signature. This is the same type electrogravitic technology that T. Townsend Brown had originally proposed in the 1930s. So this technology might date back a lot earlier than we originally thought. Uh, the proof about this comes from Electrogravitic Systems by Thomas Fallon, so you can back that up. And then I recently came across some information from a general dynamics engineer who had previously worked in the black world. And basically he said, you know, I'm done with the black world. I've been there. I'm through with it. I'm now a biker. So he left the black world behind. And he said that according to this particular general dynamics engineer who worked on the B2 program, uh, he said that for every three B2s that are built, for every uh, three, s turns out that there's seven anti-gravity versions of this B2 that are actually built, according to this general dynamics engineer. Now, September 1967, a naval combat veteran by the name of Jack Pickett, who I was really good friends with, he's no longer with us, he claims that during September 1967, he was a publisher of the NCO Club newspaper, and they were going down a perimeter road at MacDill Air Force Base, which is in Tampa, and they got to this area right here, which is called the base scrapyard. And when he got there, he looked over the chain link fence and saw four of the most incredible aircraft that he had ever seen in his entire life. Just an incredible configuration. They measured 20, 40, 70. The largest one was 116 feet in diameter. They all had the same configuration, but different sizes. They had tricycle landing gear. There was an air intake on both sides of the pilot's compartment. And then this very huge vertical tail that tapered back to the pilot's compartment had control surfaces along the circumference of the disc. <clears throat> so this is September 1967. This is the long-range bomber version of this aircraft. 
According to Jack, he was told that this was used as a long-range reconnaissance bomber during the Cold War. And so he asked a lot of questions from the general uh, who was over at McDill Air Force Base and inquired about putting together an article for the base publication newsletter. He was given authorization to write that article, which was titled Flying Saucers for Real, and then he was given 16 officially stamped black and white glossy photographs of these aircraft parked on the tarmac, in flight, uh, also with F-86 jet fighter interceptors, F-84 jet fighter interceptors as well, and had a tremendous amount of information regarding this program all ready to go into this article. But then it turns out, uh, just before going to press with this particular article, there was an overflight of a VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing version of this aircraft, which rolls down the runway. This is a horizontal takeoff bird. That particular aircraft suffered a propulsion system malfunction, dropped down to treetop level, flew directly over Miami at high speed and woke everyone up. The next morning it was all over the newspapers, all over the news. And so he brought that newspaper into the general's office the next morning and said, General, I think we've got a problem here because I'm getting ready to, to declassify and release this jet-powered disc that you have at the scrapyard, but then you're denying the existence of this aircraft that flew over downtown Miami. What, what do you guys want to do about it? So that general contacted off at Air Force Base, contacted the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Air Force, and according to the Secretary of the Air Force, it would be in the better interest of the Air Force to delay publication, and that's where this story died back in 1967. So we were within hours of getting the truth about one of our classified programs brought into the public domain within hours, but then it was canceled. So now we want to move on to flying triangles. They've been seen all around the world since at least 1974, without a doubt. Uh, we've got November 29th, 1989, Belgium was seen. January 5th, 2000, Southern Illinois. Area 51, Groom Lake, they've been seen almost in every country by every possible culture. So it's a worldwide phenomenon. We've got a case uh, <clears throat> over here of a red one with this exhaust port here. We've got a case in Detroit. We've got Belgium cases. So a, a brief cross section of these aircraft have been seen all around the world. The primary features of these triangles, they usually have a white light on the corner of each of the triangle. Some of these are between 200 and 300 feet across. This midsection is generally about 20 feet across. And then there's always this interesting structural work on the bottom and probably a red or amber light in the center of the bottom section of the craft. That's kind of the overall view of what we see here. March 31st, 1999, Kirby, a very significant sighting. And if anyone in this room is a skeptic, I just invite you to look at this gentleman's testimony, Colin Saunders, you can Google him. He gave a really nice 20-minute lecture regarding this particular sighting. A very honest gentleman. I, I totally believe his case. He was with his family driving home at around 9.50 p.m. after dinner when they came across this particular craft. He saw the aft end of it first. It was tilted up at about 15-degree angle of attack on the left-hand side. And then he said the bottom of this craft tipped up but it tipped up from the back end. And he said, he used the term that it looked like it was submerged underwater. That's how this actually moved underwater. Here's the view of what it looked like from the aft end. He said it was totally silent. And then he said it had these very interesting raised box sections on the top of the craft. The exterior pictorial version of the exterior of the craft looked like a flowing liquid mercury. It was almost alive. And he said that it was his belief that these extruded sections here were part of a, a docking mechanism with a larger craft. So as this thing flew over, he could see the bottom of it. It also had these raised sections as well. And then as this thing flew over, you can see a forward section right here. It disappeared from view, but then way off into the far horizon, there was a much larger ship that had a red light on one side and a green light on the other side, and he said that this particular aircraft appeared to be trying to dock with that larger craft. So that may be the reason for these interesting raised sections here. This thing was uh, approximately 50 feet across. 
in conjunction with a Cessna 172 that has a 27-foot wingspan. Here's Colin Sanders here. Here's his UFO model. And when I saw that UFO model, I said, wow, I want to have one of those. So I took his technical blueprint, and then in AutoCAD, I put together this schematic drawing here, which is a cardboard stock model. And uh, I've produced this for each and every one of you. So you can have a black and white version of this, so you can build your own UFO at home, which is an actual authenticated case. Uh, this is what the model looks like right here. This is what the bottom of it looks like right, right here, and so I have one for each one of you. Now, November 22nd, 1985, 15 miles northwest of Madison, Wisconsin. Very interesting case because of this interesting tube section on the bottom of this aircraft. But we don't only have the illustration. We've got the eyewitness testimony. It says the underside of the craft resembled, quote, the back of a refrigerator, like a collection of condensation pipes that ran back and forth. So keep that in mind kind of as we, as we proceed here. I asked the question, is that what you would expect to see on the bottom of an alien spacecraft? I mean, really, I thought you aliens were 100 million light years ahead of us, and yet you're flying around in these vehicles that look like the back of a refrigerator? Someone's lying to you, folks. Someone's lying to you. I, I can tell you, assure you that. January 5th, 2000, this was the first mass sighting of triangular aircraft after the year 2000, seen by at least four police officers, seen by a miniature golf owner who said that this craft looked like a two-story ranch fly right over his golf course. Uh, very well-documented case. Another case for skeptics that uh, might be sitting on the fence. Please examine the January 5th, 2000 uh, overflight of southern Illinois by these triangular-shaped craft. Some of these had a red and green section in the F portion, always these white lights at each of the corners, and then an amber or red light below the belly of the craft. Newspaper clipping service picked this up. It was seen over Dupo County, multiple counties within southern Illinois, not too far from St. Louis. May 23rd, 2001, Allen Park, Michigan. This gentleman saw this craft fly over his taxi, actually, uh, blocked out the stars as it flew over. April 3rd through the 5th, 1975, Lumberton, North Carolina. This craft was seen by multiple police officers. It had an interesting cutout notch section in the back end of the triangle, red lights along the leading section here, and then a high intensity white light that was shining down a beam onto the ground, seen by multiple eyewitnesses. This is the cutaway drawing here and shows you kind of an isometric view. This is the row of the lights on the leading edge of the craft. Again, this cutout section is another motif that we see throughout these different craft. Now this is a very interesting case that I got from David Marler, who is the premier researcher in triangular UFOs. We don't have a date, but we know the location was Oregon. According to this eyewitness, this particular craft was about 180 feet across, large triangular shaped craft with these rounded corners in this location here. According to the eyewitness, this particular craft parked itself, hovered about 20 feet above the river, the Little Putting River in Oregon, and then it started dropping down this 8 to 10 foot diameter metallic tube, went right into the, to the river, started sucking up this water, and then he noticed that right next to this tube, water was coming out too. So the water's going up, water's coming down. And then he said there was a blue beam of light that exited off the left end of the craft, and then he said something very interesting. There was lights pulsating across the circumference here. And then there were what looked like these three landing gear legs that popped out of the bottom. But these weren't landing gear legs. He called them overflow valves because water was shooting out of these overflow valves. And then there were three orange orbs that popped out of the bottom of this thing. About two minutes later, after this had completed whatever it was doing, he said it sounded like a washer machine. These orbs merged back into the craft. This craft slowly took off, and then when it reached about an altitude of about 1,000 feet, this thing took off like a spark off a grinding wheel. So that was that particular, almost a USO case. Enormous turbine blade UFO, January 24th, 1997, Puerto Rico, also came from the David Marler files. Basically, a primary eyewitness saw this particular craft hover near his location, 
Now, if you look at the size, he estimates between 500 and 800 feet across. We're talking a massive ship here. Uh, Multicolored lights along the leading portion of the vehicle. Then he said it had this section on the bottom that had these rotating turbine blades. But it was his impression that these turbine blades were rotating far too slow to support this vehicle. So there's no way it could be the primary source of propulsion, according to the eyewitness. He also said that there was a strange being that had a pear-shaped head on a transparent cupola or dome section of this aircraft. Two minutes after observing this aircraft, a black 4x4 vehicle pulled up right next to him. A security agent got out of that vehicle, started questioning about this particular craft. No sooner did that security agent start interrogating the primary eyewitness. Two identical craft to this first one popped out of the clouds and started following this original craft. This craft, at that point, started introducing a... Hmm, it was kind of like a smoky blue glow around this vehicle, and then this thing took off. The other ones were trying to chase after it, but they couldn't get it. So this is January 1st, 1997. Another case from the David Marler files, a particular illustration here. August 25th, 1990, Barnsley, England. Primary eyewitness and her, his wife were returning from a Fleetwood Mac concert at night when out of nowhere coming <laughs> this strange triangular-shaped craft that he estimated between 100 and 200 feet across emerged from a dark, misty cloud directly below the cloud bank and he said he saw it long enough, 30 seconds, long enough to get some really good details. It had one light on each terminating point of the triangle, one light on the bottom here that was white, and then he said it had this recessed section on the belly of the craft. And in that recessed section, he could see what looked like cross beam and girder construction, very structural construction on this bottom point here. And then there was these series of white lit backlit windows that had these humanoid figures, and it was his impression that this was a man-made vehicle. That's what his impression was, uh, that these were actually man-made vehicles. This particular individual on the right seemed to be either pointing or waving back to the primary eyewitness. Now, North Wales Triangle, sighted over the M56 motorway on June 1st, 1997, flew across the motorway at about 100 miles an hour, startled people on the motorway, and then zipped off at a high rate of speed. That's all the details we have on that particular case. So now we move on to the ever-present, ubiquitous, everyone's favorite triangle, the TR-3B. Anything having to do with the TR-3B has to be credited to Edgar Fouché. I want to give him credit for Edgar Fouché. I also want to mention that Edgar Fouché has no first-hand knowledge specifically dealing with this aircraft. So he didn't work on this program, but he claims that he knew people at Area 51 who did. I want to make that perfectly clear. Also want to state that uh, I don't want to divert any way, shape, or form or percentage from his original testimony. I want to give you his straight answers to a number of questions that I uh, brought to his attention. This is his response, so I don't want to divert from anything that he had to say. Technical specifications regarding the TR-3B. According to Edgar Fouché, there are two different sizes of the TR-3B, approximately 250 feet per side for the prototype version, 600 feet per side for the operational model. The overall mission of the TR-3B is logistic support and transportation for the secret space command. If used on a planet or moon or large outpost, you would have a ready-made transportable space station. The TR-3B carries a crew of four in the prototype version. The flight control system used on the TR-3B consists of variable vector intake and thrusters on the edges and advanced multi-mold propulsion engines on each tip of the triangle. Two nuclear reactors serve as the power source for the magnetic field disruptor, also known as an MFD. The magnetic field disruptor utilizes a mercury liquid plasma, which is pressurized to 250,000 atmospheres and rotated at 50,000 RPM, resulting in a distortion or warpage of the localized gravity field by up to 89%. Therefore, G-forces are also reduced by 89%. So in effect, what he's saying is that this MFD <clears throat> interacts with how gravity interacts with mass 
So you could be doing 1,000 miles an hour, make a left-hand turn 90 degrees, and you'd only feel 11% of the Gs. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about anti-gravity per se, but a, a disruption of the gravi- uh, gravity field. Materials used to construct the TR-3B consisted of advanced composites, metamaterials, and titanium. Three prototype TR-3Bs uh, bees were built. Cost per TR-3B in 1990 dollars was one billion per craft. Sightings uh, by Edgar Fouché is 1975 high in the atmosphere at night at Edwards Air Force Base, 1976 within the southern part of the Nellis Range, and the late 1970s Groom Air Base. That's the one we want to focus on. TR-3B utilizes telescopic landing gear legs with T-pads operated by the National Reconnaissance Office, the National Security Agency, and the CIA. The craft exhibits a very low electromagnetic humming noise during operation. One light was located on each tip of the triangle. The craft incorporates electrochromic panels used for daytime stealth operation. So when you talk about electrochromic panels, what they're essentially doing is they're electronically transferring the image and what's in back of the craft to the forward portion, essentially allowing it to blend in with the background, basically becoming, bringing it uh, invisible. Uh, vents on the side of the craft serve as variable vectored intake exhaust depending upon which direction the vehicle is going. So this is a drawing put together showing you these vents right here. This is the crew compartment and then the magnetic field disruptor right here. So then I asked Edgar Fouché, Edgar, instead of you just talking about the, the TR-3B, can you give me an illustration of your sighting? This is what he came up with. This is Edgar Fouché's illustration of his sighting. <clears throat> this would have been 1979 at uh, Area 51. This is avionics building number nine the Air, uh, Avionics Laboratory at Area 51. Again, this is the longest runway right here. And he was going from the Avionics Laboratory to a blue blacked out windowed bus, Air Force bus. So it was about a 100 foot walk. And as he's walking to this bus, they had him wear these blacked out welder's goggles so he couldn't see anything around. Edgar Fouché is a pretty big guy, so when he looked down, there was a crack between the top portion of his forehead and the top portion of these welder's goggles, and he could see a crack of light. He looked outside that light and saw the TR-3B about 500 feet away. This is according to Edgar Fouché. So if you look at this runway diagram, you look at the buildings. Remember, these are the red hat hangers right here. We're talking at least 500 feet, and so that's how close he got to perhaps one of our classified flying triangles. Again, <clears throat> flying triangles, UFOs, the estimate of the situation, David Marler, <clears throat> this is by Richard Dolan Press, our good friend Richard Dolan. Anyone who's a skeptic regarding flying triangles, please look into this book and you'll see that there's quite a, a good historical background. I want to make a statement here. If you thought that all triangular UFO cases were the direct result of classified military aircraft, that would be incorrect. Now, how do we know this? Sightings of these triangular-shaped craft date back to 1890. Kelly Johnson, who formed the Skunk Works, he wasn't even born yet, so it couldn't be a Lockheed bird, right? It It has to be something else. Now, when we talk about these liquid mercury plasma engines on the magnetic field disruptor associated with the TR-3B, that's the same thing we hear about on these Vimana aircraft that were 2,000 years before the time of Christ in the ancient Indian Sanskrit text. They talk about liquid mercury plasma engines with these Vimana type craft. So this technology might date back much earlier than we thought. Is that the same technology that's used here in the Kecksburg Acorn? that was recovered in Pennsylvania, December 9th, 1965. Is that the same technology used on the Nazi Bell, 1945? They had the same dimensions, the same configuration, the same bumper around the bottom circumference, the same strange hieroglyphic writing along the bottom. Both the uh, bell here, it also had these insulating bricks that were associated with test flights. Uh, Also, Joseph P. Farrell talked about how plants within the vicinity of test flights of the bell turned to goo within two hours. Scientists who were near the bell during operation died immediately. Uh, He also talks about how there's two counter-rotating drums 
that have a radioactive uh, isotope of mercury called cerium-525. That may be some of the propulsion systems associated with the Bell. Now, <clears throat> by May of 1945... Adolf Hitler had 62 of the scientists associated with the Bell program murdered. Uh, these were brought up in the trials after Nazi criminal war crimes were brought to public. And so they talked about these 62 t scientists being uh, murdered associated with the Bell program. My question is, did SS General Hans Kammler, who was involved in the Bell product program, did he cut a deal with the Americans did he have his record expunged of any crimes in exchange for technology? That's something we definitely want to keep in mind. Cash Landrum incident, Huffman, Texas, December 29, 1980. This, by any other means, skeptics cannot debunk this case. This case had stood the test of time for so long now, and I invite anyone who's questioning the validity of some of these cases, please look at this case. You'll find that this has remained rock solid. Three eyewitnesses, Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, Colby Landrum, were driving around uh, 9 p.m. Huffman, Texas, when they noticed a bright light approaching their vehicle. It got brighter and brighter and brighter. It got so bright they became horrified. They were scared. It was traumatic. She even mentioned that the, she thought this was the second coming. She thought this is the end of the world. And what she saw was this twin double ice cream cone craft that was about 90 feet tall had a series of light-colored blue portholes. We don't know if these were portholes, but they were circular outlets in this location here. It was about 30 feet above the pavement here. She slammed on her brakes. Betty Cash got out of the car, started going to the forward portion of the car to see this thing as a better look. And then it had these strange flames that were blue in color that every time the flame came out, this craft would bob up, and then once the flame stopped, this craft would start slowly settling down again. This happened for about two minutes. At that point, Betty Cash was just about ready to get back into the vehicle. Now keep in mind, this is December 29th, 1980. It was cold outside. Just about the time she was getting ready to put her hand on that car door, she put her hand there and it burned the skin right off her hand. The whole exterior of the vehicle was becoming very hot. Once they, she got back inside the car, <clears throat> they had to turn the air conditioning on. It was so hot within this vehicle. This craft also emitted a beeping noise as this engine produced this thrust. And then about a minute after this departed, there were no less than 23 double rotor Chinook CH-47s chasing after this craft with two UH-1 Hueys in chase with high intensity light beams like they were shepherding this vehicle, like they had foreknowledge of this particular flight. Now, it's my personal opinion that this was one of ours, ladies and gentlemen. Now, how can I back this up? If you look at this hearing before the Subcommittee on Research and Development, Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, this is the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Program, July 23rd, 1959. Once you start looking at this document, you start finding out how much the United States Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the Atomic Energy Commission spent on procurement funding on the NEPA program, the Nuclear Energy for Propulsion of Aircraft. Combined, they spent almost a billion dollars by 1960. This is a schematic drawing of an atomic liquid fuel rocket with subcritical reactor. So at least by 1960, they had the procurement funding, the engineering know-how to perhaps build such a craft. Here again, aircraft nuclear propulsion system, different cutaways within that diagram to back this up. So again, we have a legacy of technology paperwork to back this up. I believe that this was a test flight of our one of our original NEPA programs. It was an early NEPA program. There was a whole breach within that subcritical reactor that started spewing out fissionable material, and that's how Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum died from the effects of radiation poisoning regarding this. So it's important that we hold our government liable for essentially the murder of these two individuals. This case was actually never heard of in court. It was thrown out of court due to lack of evidence. Now, significant statements by Ben Rich regarding advanced aerospace propulsion systems and technology. Ben Rich, very interesting gentleman. 
Uh, I met with his son, Michael Rich, at the Rand Corporation. Uh, he was very nice, didn't reveal any secrets, but important to keep in mind, Ben took over the reins of the Skunk Works from Kelly Johnson in Burbank back in 1975. He headed the Skunk Works until 1991. And I want to really bring out some points here that I think are, are very important regarding what Ben Rich said about the technologies that we're talking about in this conference. Now, according to Ben Rich, and you can verify all these, they've been authenticated. I invite you to check this out yourself. Uh, we did the F-104, the C-130, the U-2, SR-71, F-117, and many other programs that I can't talk about. We are still working very hard. I just can't tell you what we're doing. Right, patterson Air Force Base slide presentation, September 26, 1992. Again, the Air Force has just given us a contract to take ET back home. We already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects. It would take an act of God to get them out to benefit humanity. There is an error in the equations. What equations is he talking about? There is an error in the equations, and we have figured it out, and now know how to travel to the stars, and it won't take a lifetime to do it. So what equations is Ben Rich talking about here? It is time to end all secrecy on this, as it no longer poses a national security threat and make the technology available for use in the private sector. It says, we have some new things. We are not stagnating. What we are doing is updating ourselves without advertising. There are some new programs and certain things, some of them 20 or 30 years old, that are still breakthroughs and appropriate to keep quiet about. Other people don't have them yet. And then it says here, September 7th, 1988, AIAA lecture, so you can back that up too. I wish I could tell you about the projects we are currently working on. They are both fascinating and fantastic. They call for technologies once only dreamed of by science fiction writers, according to Ben Rich. What could, what could that mean? Now, these are, this is a new group that maybe some of you haven't heard of before. I got this from the Huntington Library from the papers of Ben R. Rich. The Skunk Works is always busy. It's fortunate that we are able to turn out a breakthrough about every 10 years. The airplanes that uh, we are building today, you won't hear about for another 10 years. Anything you can think of, we can do. And if not, maybe we have already done it. I cannot talk to you about anything we are doing today or have been doing probably for at least five or 10 years. If you saw the configurations I have on my desk today, they're mind boggling because if you can think of it, we can design it at the Skunk Works. So that's according to Ben Rich. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't think you're going to get a better uh, group of comments regarding advanced aerospace propulsion systems. Now, John Andrews, who we mentioned before, was very good friends with Ben Rich. These two gentlemen, over decades, played this word scrabble game where Ben Rich would kind of submit little hints to John, and that's how he was able to design the F-19 stealth model that turned out to be the highest selling plastic aircraft model of all history. Over one million units were sold. So John Andrews wrote a letter in 1986 to Ben Rich regarding his personal opinion of UFOs, even of crash retrievals. This is his original reply letter to John Andrews, dated July 8, 1986. It says, Dear John, in response to your letter of July 1st, I am a believer, and so is Kelly Johnson. So he's talking about UFOs, extraterrestrial technology. So if it's good enough for Kelly Johnson, to me, it's good enough for me. Now, here is the reply that John Andrews sent back to Ben Rich. He wanted to get some clarification. So Mr. Ben Rich, Lockheed Advanced Aeronautics Company, this is Burbank, California, 10 July 1986. Dear Ben, a short note to clarify your interesting response regarding being a quote-unquote believer contained in your 8th July 1986 letter. The topic is UFO. I believe there are lots of UFOs. I am also tending to believe there are two types of UFOs or categories. A, man-made UFOs. B, extraterrestrial UFOs. I believe with certainty in man-made UFOs. I am tending to believe there are also extraterrestrial UFOs. Having the highest respect for both you and Kelly, I'd appreciate knowing your belief in both categories. So then Ben Rich sent back the letter. I was able to get the actual letter. Lockheed Company letterhead, July uh, 21st, 1986. Dear John, this is the re response. Yes, I'm a believer in both categories. I feel everything is possible. Many of our man-made UFOs were unfunded opportunities. In both categories, there are lots of kooks and charlatans. Be cautious, Ben Rich. So 
The $64 billion question is, what did Ben Rich mean when he talked about unfunded opportunities, UFO? Was Ben Rich talking about programs that didn't get funded at the Skunk Works? Or, as some have suggested, which could be a possibility, was he talking about freebies or hand-me-downs that we got for others? Is that a possibility? It's certainly a possibility. But by 1995, Ben had passed away, so we don't know the answer to that question. Now, a good friend of mine, Jim Goodall, uh, wrote a letter to Ben Rich basically requesting uh, a taped interview. Just go over a couple of quick points. I would like to do a taped interview with you sometime in the near future. So obviously, Jim knew that time was getting short for Ben. He wanted to get all this documented on videotape. It says, we would cover everything that you have ever been involved in with your many years at Lockheed Skunk Works. We would cover all bases, leaving nothing out. He also said that he'd be glad to hold on to that tape for 10 years, 20 years, until he decided that it was appropriate to release into the public domain. Now, unfortunately, that inter interview never took place because, as we mentioned, Ben Rich passed away in 1995. But just prior to Ben's passing, Jim Goodall got one final telephone conversation in to Ben Rich, who was dying at the hospital, and this is what uh, Ben Rich told Jim Goodall over the phone just before he died. He says, Jim, we have things in the Nevada desert that are 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. If you've seen it on Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, d done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. So again, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think it's going to get any better than that. Talking about technologies that are 50 years beyond what we can comprehend from the skunk works. A couple of uh, UFO cases that we should consider here. Hudson Valley boomerang. Between 1982 and 1989, over 25,000 eyewitnesses reported a gigantic chevron or boomerang-shaped craft that hovered over <laughs> cities uh, north of New York City, about 20 minutes north of New York City. Primary eyewitnesses reported uh, from air traffic controllers, doctors, policemen, law enforcement personnel. What they reported seeing is this boomerang-shaped craft with these tubes, pipes, and cylinders on the bottom of the vehicle, a very structured craft on the bottom. Also had multicolored flashing lights on the bottom as well. That's a very interesting thing to consider because it's been repeated over and over again. Now, March 24th, 1983, Taconic Stark Parkway, New York. This is on a Thursday. Multiple eyewitnesses saw a gigantic 300 feet per side flying boomerang-shaped craft with a triangle trailing edge, hover over the Taconic State Parkway. People pulled over to the side of the road, slammed on their brakes, got out of their car, looked up and saw this craft. But then they said when they saw the bottom of it, it had these transparent panels so you could see inside the structure of the craft. And eyewitnesses re reported seeing tubes, pipes, cylinders, steel girder, mechanical truss tube construction like a truss bridge. That's what they reported. So I want to ask everyone here, does, and you don't have to answer, does anyone here know what happened one day prior to this event? What happened on March 23rd, 1983? Reagan's speech, thank you. March 23rd, 1983 was Reagan's speech. He, he proposed the SDI program. So I, I asked the question, is there a connection between the Hudson Valley boomerang and the SDI program by Ronald Reagan. Were they using these craft flying over mar large American cities as a nuclear deterrent, setting up an electromagnetic umbre umbrella protecting us from uh, incoming enemy Russian ICBMs? Is that a possibility? I'm just throwing it out there. Characteristics of the Hudson Valley boomerang. Sightings of the craft came in from Connecticut, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. The craft was virtually silent and measured between 300 and 900 feet across. The UFO was seen hovering over busy expressways, lakes, and rivers. The object was reported by airline pilots, air traffic controllers, doctors, law lawyers, local law enfor enforcement, firemen, computer programmers. The craft appeared to have an industrial steel structural girder and crossbeam internal construction like a truss bridge. So what I've tried to do here is I've incorporated every conceivable configuration that was seen by the eyewitnesses. Again, we've got this tubes, pipes, and cylinders that was seen on the bottom of the vehicle, a triangle trailing edge, 
And then here we've got this section here showing you these transparent panels. Over here, I've shown you the original configuration of the B-2 stealth bomber. This is vintage 1983. Northrop spent $22.3 billion of our tax dollars designing this B-2 stealth bomber. 1983, they had absolutely nothing to show for our $22.3 billion. At the end of 1983, the North, uh, Air Force and Northrop decided that they no longer wanted to have these uh, low altitude bombing platforms and they changed the wing configuration to the double W that we see today. That cost all of us a, a, a billion dollars for the wing redesign. Now instead of me just talking about it just by myself, I wasn't there. I want to give you the eyewitness testimony directly from the people who saw this craft. This is Dennis Sant, very uh, respectable gentleman. Here's his quote. This is Philadelphia Inquirer, September 28, 1984. As it hovered, I could make out dark, smoky colored metallic beams underneath huge, huge beams, according to Dennis Sant, March 17th, which was a Thursday when this actually took place. Again, Mo, uh, Maureen o, Monique O'Driscoll, she sighted the object on March 17th, 1983, on a Thursday. This is his, her quote, and this is her painting that she made of this craft. I could see the underbelly part. It's solid. It had metal-type work, like cross beams and tubular things hanging down here and there. I was so close to it, I could have thrown a ball and hit it. That's from Monique O'Driscoll. This thing flew right over her head. Now, June 24th, 1984, Indian Point Nuclear Power Reactor. Uh, something very significant happened on this particular night. I believe it may be one of the top three UFO cases of all history. According to no less than 12 Nuclear Regulatory Committee security guards, a gigantic, repeat, gigantic 900-foot-wide boomerang-shaped craft hovered over Reactor 3 for 20 minutes. So this is confirmed by 12 security guards, and this is a uh, West Crumb illustration of what this thing looked like. They had shotguns pointed at this thing. It shut down the security system of the nuclear power plant. It violated prohibited airspace. But then there was a, uh, one of the security guards was in this remote hangar here. He had a camera, a remote camera, that was capturing all this on videotape. And in his words, quote, this craft was so large that he had to pan the camera 180 degrees across just to get the whole thing in the field of view. That's how big this craft was. That videotape was later confiscated by government officials. But there is a videotape of this particular event. Phoenix Lights, March 13, 1997. Again, boomerang-shaped craft. It had a very small triangle trailing edge here, seen by thousands of eyewitnesses. Uh, of course, the government tried to explain it away as flares, but I question how could flares start out north of Prescott, go down through prohibited airspace at Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix, and then continue down all the way to Tucson? Flares can't go that far. Eyewitnesses reported that the lights on this vehicle they didn't look like just lights, but they were canister or studio lights that were embedded into the lower belly structure of the aircraft. Phoenix lights, we have also want to cover the Belgium Triangle. This is November 29th, 1989. This is the newspaper clipping uh, from the report talking about a gigantic 300 foot per side. Some eyewitnesses reported that this was over a football field inside. Um, also, we have the section here where the whole entire field section was lit up by the light that this craft emitted. A couple of quick reference points on this here from the Sun, July 23rd, 1991. We are under a sort of siege by high-tech flying machines. These craft are clearly the product of an advanced society and are under intelligent control. Their shape, size, speed, and the way they move are unlike anything known on Earth. These UFOs are technological marvels. They operate with a propulsion system unlike anything man has ever seen. Several eyewitnesses describe the craft as big or bigger than an aircraft carrier or as big as a football field. One witness said that while the object was flying directly overhead, one could not see the front part and the end at the same time because it was too big. The craft had the capability of hovering and at times would suddenly accelerate so rapidly that it would be across the horizon in a second or two and sometimes it would flash right back. In many cases, people saw structure underneath the craft which included heavy metal parts, crisscross effects, diamond-shaped work, and tubular things here and there. So that's important to keep in mind. This was also tracked by two F-16s that got within 20 miles of this particular craft. 
It also released uh, hundreds of small objects that were on the bottom of it. And then during this particular Belgian wave, flying squares, rectangles, platforms, and a manta ray shaped craft were also seen by the eyewitnesses. So it wasn't just triangles that we were seeing here. Here is the illustration of this F-16 attempted intercept. Uh, this thing was going at about 250 knots, accelerating to about 1,800 knots within two seconds. That's equivalent to about 40 Gs acceleration. Now, under normal circumstances, that would kill uh, pilots. But if they're using another type of propulsion system, that may not be the case. Now, what are we talking about? Is this a man-made vehicle? We have the same tube pipes and cylinders configuration on the bottom of the Belgian Triangle that we looked at in the Hudson Valley Boomerang. Here's the radar track here from the onboard F-16 targeting radar. There were three independent ground radar tracking stations that also track this on radar. Uh, I want to bring your attention to a manta ray shaped craft that was also seen December 1st, 1989. The movement of the lights was kind of like back and forth and it looked very similar to the Knight Rider TV series in 1980s, Knight Industries 2000. That's the movement of this light. It also looked like these Cylon Centurion helmets that were used in the 80s TV hit Battlestar Galactica. But the most important point I want to bring to your attention here, and this comes from Joseph Jones, who's another black aircraft researcher. He states that it was a joint program between Lockheed Skunk Works and British Aerospace this is vintage 1984, 1985. They were developing something called Triangulum. That was the code name for this aircraft. And they were working on something called an EM drive. And this is part of a program called Brilliant Invader. That was the code name for this operation. So ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that this may be in point of fact, the explanation for the Belgium Triangle Wave 1989, 1990, which was the Brilliant Invader joint NATO, naval, uh, NATO training exercise. Knight Rider shows you the configuration of the lights in this location, also the Cylon Centurion helmet here. Now, what evidence do we have to back this up? Is it just uh, fairy tales or do we have something to back this up? Jane's Defense Week, September 4th, 1996, has a very interesting article regarding the relationship between the UK and the US regarding stealth technology. The UK's relationship with the USA on stealth runs very deep, has been going on for many decades, and is extremely secret. Do we have anything else to back this up? It turns out that by the 1960s, they had accumulated so much information regarding what was done after World War II when British intelligence was basically sucking up every shred of evidence re recovered from the Nazis regarding radar cross-section development, that report was put in something called the Dawson Report, and then during an unknown date within the 60s, that report was brought over to Washington, D.C. and given to the defense contractors, probably Lockheed. So the other piece of evidence here is this very interesting book called I could tell you, but then you would have to be destroyed by me, by Trevor Paglin. Very interesting patch in this location right here. You'll note that the location of the beam of light is similar to the location of where the Belgium Triangle sightings actually took place. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've presented both sides of this case. I want to leave it to your discretion to decide who's who and what technology is actually being used. My point here is I'd like to see this technology handed over to the scientific community for the betterment of everyone on this planet. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Really appreciate that.